Hello everybody! So this video is a little crossover project between the channel Calico Silver and myself. And if you don't know Jeff's channel, then it's about time to check it out because uh, it's uh, full of wonderful music related videos that are not only witty but also very versatile and even eclectic, uh, ranging from kind of reviews of classic big names like Bob Dylan or Joni Mitchell. Uh, on the one side, on the other side, you have uh, more deep cut material like uh, Jan Ackermann and all kind of jazz fusion guitarists. Uh, I'm pretty sure that he has by far the most YouTube videos on Terry Ripdal. And um, overall, um, Jeff is also a great musician, which gives his analysis and his reviews an additional layer of gravitas, I think, a layer that uh, someone like me is certainly missing. And also he's very eloquent. On the other hand, he's sometimes a bit of a punk, uh, but uh, that's part of the fun, because sometimes he just opens a bottle of beer and uh, if something needs to be said, he will say it. So um, check out his channel. If you haven't done already, I will certainly put um, the the link to his channel under this video, so you are only two clicks away. Let's get on with the questions. Now, first I will move my own five questions out of the way, and then we can move forward to Jeff quest, Jeff's questions, um, which in itself is kind of interesting because uh, if you compare my questions with his que with his questions, it's they're quite different. I mean, my, my questions are all completely nerdy. Um, once again, proving that uh, the pinnacle of my education was probably watching Star Trek. While Jeff's questions are kind of like a uh, questionnaire designed by an art professor, uh, art history professor for his students. So it's a bit on a different level. But without further ado, let's start with it. Um, I have a reputation to be long-winded and rambling anyway, so uh, this is also a bit of a challenge to uh, keep it uh, with some brevity. So uh, first, uh, my five questions. The first question was, uh, you discover a time machine, the reach is only 60 years and there are only two hyper-temporal spark plugs left. One is for the return trip. Um, where would you travel, assuming it is music related? And yes, technically one could use the second spark plug for another trip and forgo the return. Um, but um, I gave this actually a little bit of a thought and realized that my time traveling visit would focus on the years 1979 to 1980. Because in this short period of time of about 18 months, I would be able to see probably my favorite concerts that I would like to see and that I have never seen live, but only as a video footage. And uh, let me uh, accompany this with some visual aids. <laughs> so my journey through time would start on the 7th of March in 1979 in Oxford, England. Uh, where a concert of the band Bruford took place around the time when this album was released, their second album. Um, this is probably my favorite lineup, uh, of course, including uh, Bill Bruford on drums, um, Dave Stewart on keyboards, Jeff Berlin on bass and the epic Alan Holdsworth on guitar. And this has always been somewhat my favorite concert. Um, there is actually a recording of this on a DVD and a live CD. I mean, the quality is not that good. Um, this was kind of re recorded by a BBC television team uh, for a TV show. So um, it has uh, obviously kind of sonic limitations, but um, as an event, it's kind of exactly my blood type. And uh, it has the, the wonderful Annette Peacock on vocals, 
uh, delivering some very difficult melody lines. So overall this is a wonderful stop on my journey through time. And um, as I said, in the same period of time I would be able to travel, travel to North Italy just to see Talking Heads live um, while touring the Remain in Light album. So when someone mentions Talking Head live anywhere on the internet, immediately people write uh, in the commentaries about this kind of live movie they did like two years later, which was called Stop Making Sense. And usually the, the kind of a platitude or tagline is, uh, you have to see this, this is the best uh, concert movie ever produced. This seems like to be a consensus. But honestly, I don't feel that way. I think uh, for diehard Talking Heads fans, Stop Making Sense may be the perfect uh, concert movie. But um, I'm not that much of a fan of the Talking Heads. I'm just really fascinated by this short period of time when they were working with Brian Eno and when they went on tour playing their album. And this was this kind of a short period of time when they had uh, Bernie Worrell on keyboards and Adrian Bellew on guitar. Um, you had Buster Jones on bass and Nona Hendrix on vocals. So this was this giant mayhem going on. And there is actually a, again, a kind of a TV pro shot made of this performance during a concert, I think in Rome or maybe in Milan, um, where you just, I mean, it's again, the quality is not optimal, but uh, you really feel um, this, the energy and the heat and the sweat in the room. It's a complete mayhem, this entire concert. It's one of the best concert uh, recordings I've ever seen, despite being kind of technically not that good and kind of old uh, copied footage. But um, it certainly means much more to me than stop making sense. And uh, there is... Thankfully, there is a live album by Talking Heads that captures this energy um, on a record. Um, it is a uh, double album called The Name of This Band is Talking Heads. And um, it's kind of a divided double album because the one disc is uh, their live material before they started this glorious uh, chapter uh, in their history. But uh, the second disc is the one disc that counts for me, that I think is really great and uh, that kind of captures uh, this uh, unique moment in time. The next question of mine was, uh, is there an album where you like only one half of the record and don't care much about the rest? So um, I know that people oftentimes think that about metal by Pink Floyd. I've heard that a lot, like, yes, I like the B-side, Echoes is wonderful, but I kind of don't like the A-side. And I do not agree with that, because in the case of metal, I actually like the A-side a lot. I think it has a lot to offer to me. And uh, But uh, this question makes sense to me, because um, there are two other albums where I kind of feel like kind of strongly about it. The one is uh, the Valentine Suite by Colosseum, um, which uh, I think had, has this wonderful B-side, this so-called Valentine Suite, which is uh, one of those early examples of this kind of progressive rock, big canvas uh, composition where one track takes the entire uh, side of a record. Now the A-side, on the other hand, is kind of still very rooted in this late 60s blues rock, which I was never too fond of. Um, so um, I'm not saying that it's bad music or something like that, but um, it's certainly never been too appealing to me. Now this case is even stronger with this album, and uh, this might, may probably upset some people, but I think in the Land of Grey and Pink by Caravan has really this wonderful B-side, uh, again a giant composition called Nine Feet Underground, which is 22 minutes long, which really is great, very much kind of in this vibe of Canterbury music, like, uh, it sounds a bit like Camel, and uh, but the A-side, uh, it's kind of meh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Golf Girl is kind of a funny opener, 
but uh, but I never really could relate to the songs on the A side, to be honest. So those things do happen. Third question, um, do you have a favorite album that is generally being considered one of the worst albums of the particular band in question? Now, this time, this round, I will leave you alone with Under Wraps by Jethro Tull because I have kind of beaten the drum quite a lot for this record. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's uh, put it aside for this one time. But um, it will probably shock you and uh, I want to ask you to search in your heart to be tolerant with me and not to unsubscribe immediately after I say that. But uh, this is my favorite The Who album. It's hard ending um, kind of their existence in the 80s and um, it's been generally disregarded by everyone more or less in the course of the last 30 years. Um, now let's move out the controversial moment out of the way. Do I think it's a better album than Tommy, Quadrophenia or Who's Next? No, I don't think that. Um, I'm still mentally sound enough to understand that those other albums have a much greater role in music history in general and uh, have a lot to offer being true masterpieces. But that doesn't mean that they mean more to me compared with this record. So I don't think it's the better record, but as a record um, I can relate better to it. And um, I think it's massively underrated, it's massively misunderstood, I think. Um, and it's quite, it's, 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 it's puzzling to me that it's not being discovered more. I see it kind of slowly appearing into people's consciousness lately, but usually only because of Eminence Front, which is kind of being rediscovered as this kind of a uh, kind of a kind of a left field uh, curious track. But again, I think the album is misunderstood. I think uh, there are some incredible compositions here. It's in parts much more a thoughtful album than the one that The Who released prior to that. Um, Daltrey is singing wonderfully here. I mean, you, you you can hear him singing in ways and styles that you probably never heard him singing before. And it kind of shows what a great singer he is or he was at this point in time. Um, yeah, I think, I think the wonderful record is, I think it's very misunderstood. And uh, um, so just simply based on how I relate to the songs, um, this is most certainly my favorite The Who album. The fourth question is, can you talk a bit about the separation of the artist and the art? Do you find it easy, difficult with artists that have some questionable reputations? Yeah, it's an interesting topic that always interested me and um, in a sense I have changed during the course of my life. I think I was much less willing to uh, give an artist a break uh, when I was younger. It's probably one of the reasons why it took me basically years and maybe even decades longer to get into Chikoria and return to forever, um, simply based on the fact how much I despise Scientology. And it takes a while until you kind of mellow out and think, yeah, but it's kind of not my problem. I'm, I'm interested in the music. But at the same time, I kind of understand that people have their limits regarding those things. And if there is something that just rubs you the wrong way, there's just nothing you can do about it. I mean, if I kind of get it. I mean, if people feel certain unease regarding Michael Jackson, it's their right to feel like that. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, rich adult people do stupid things. But while I was kind of mentally preparing for this video, I certainly had this little notion or realization that uh, while we can agonize a little bit over which artists misbehaved and how it should in influence our perception of their work, um, let's not forget that uh, the transgression of the artistic world is microscopic compared with the transgressions 
happening in the world of the producers and record company executives, film industry executives. I mean, we can, you can work yourself over Louis C.K. doing his thing, but it's nothing compared to the disgusting stuff that is going on on the management level of companies that make money from art. So, um, me personally, I was always kind of lucky because I am uh, always kind of infatuated with music, with bands and musicians that generally have uh, the the reputation of being boring people yeah you just you just don't <laughs> you just don't expect scandals from bill bruford or um alan holdsworth so um that's this this makes it kind of easy for me if i was a fan of kind of 70s hard rock bands of the style of uh, black sabbath led zeppelin and deep purple i would probably personally or inside of me get more into kind of uh, deep waters uh, agonizing over all kind of stories about how uh, they treated women and stuff like that so it's I guess uh, it's it's always I mean on the other hand and I don't want to I don't want to dwell too much on that because otherwise it becomes this long video again um, the other thing is certainly that uh, we also have to kind of learn to let people out of the doghouse again it can't be that if young people screw up, um, even if they are famous or rich or whatever, it, you can't hold it over their head like a death, like a life sentence for the next 40, 50 years. It makes just no sense. Um, and uh, sometimes it has a very negative um, effect because it creates a myth or a legend of a transgression that in reality was not half as bad as kind of the the, the folky lore in a course of 40, uh, 50 years then creates around it and kind of blows it completely out of proportion. And yes, I'm talking about the Roman Polanski. So yeah, fuck you. So uh, let's move on to the next question. And uh, it is, uh, are there bands that people immediately assume you like based on your videos, for example, but strangely enough that you never grew fond of. That is true. Um, two bands come immediately to mind and they both start with the same letter. The one is the Canadian band Rush. I don't know why. Um, it makes sense that people assume when they figure out I like Yes and Emerson like and Palmer and Rick Wakeman and it makes sense that I would like Rush, but I kind of don't. And I tried a few times. Um, I'm not saying this will never happen. I just, for some strange reasons that I really can't explain, I kind of can't gel with that music. Um, I mean, the components are all there for me to like it, but it kind of never sparked, it never clicked for me. Um, but um, um, never say never. The other case is kind of more guttural, I think, more visceral, and uh, that's quite unfortunate and I'm talking about Radiohead. So people sometimes think I have to be a Radiohead fan, I have to like them because they are like this most uh, creative, innovative band of the later years and um, they have created kind of a milestone albums and they they started as part of a, well, kind of not that interesting uh, musical environment of the late 90s of this kind of a Britpop uh, scene that I truly hate, honestly, but they immediately started to evolve and created kind of their own world. And I, on an intellectual level, I fully agree with that. And I certainly think that they should be complimented and lauded it for this achieve for this achievement. But just, I just can't listen to them. I kind of don't like the harmonies they are using. They sound very kind of derivative to me and same old, same old, just, enhanced with, with some special effects and I really really can't take the vocals I mean I I'm not a fan of this kind of a whiny whiny constantly complaining style of singing that uh, has a lot to do with this kind of a British scene of the late 90s and uh, certainly one of the reasons why I kind of stopped paying attention to popular kind of top 10 music back in the day so again I'm not taking anything away from Radiohead it's just it just, I 
can't just digest the music. So um, let's move on to the second half of this video which um, has uh, questions uh, designed by Jeff and um, this already starts with something very kind of heady. Consider a musical element, rhythmic, harmonic, melodic, etc. that you've always valued highly and sought after when exploring new music. Then consider an artist who prompted you to significantly reconsider, not negate necessarily, but reconsider that evaluation. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a question that I have had to read a few times just to fully grasp the concept behind it. And I have kind of two answers that are completely opposite and these two answers have nothing to do with each other. Let me keep the first part of the answer really quick so it doesn't get too, uh, too long-winded. Um, so the first part of the answer would be Alan Holdsworth. So uh, I think um, before I discovered Alan Holdsworth, like many people before me, I was certainly easier impressed by certain effect-driven, showy style of guitar playing and soloing. Um, and uh, once, you st once you start to study Alan Holdsworth, who was not much into this kind of stuff, I mean, he developed a completely different, different style of music, a different approach uh, to, to solos and to overall the musical presentation of, of guitar work. Um, I must say, in hindsight, uh, suddenly you don't feel that much kind of impressed by uh, instrumentalists like Joe Bonamassa or Eddie Van Halen, which again, it's, it's not my effort to take anything away from their style of playing, but um, you kind of enhance, you enhance your perception of what's possible and you realize that uh, there is kind of an aesthetic in a certain purist approach to guitar playing. A guitar doesn't always uh, need to scream and dive and you don't always need to bend three strings at the same time and, and be completely trapped in these mannerisms. There is a different way to play guitar and certainly this happened for me through Alan Holdsworth, which doesn't mean that I don't enjoy, you know, uh, some good old um, Gary Moore guitar solo, I certainly do, but it has kind of uh, amended a little bit uh, my perception of guitar playing. Now the other half of the of the answer is a very different story and uh, it's kind of interesting and um, so, um, but I try to keep it really quick before I end up blathering about it for 20 minutes. So as I said, in the 90s I kind of went underground and started just to listen to music kind of produced for an audience of 15 people. Uh, going to concerts, which were basically just some some cellar rooms uh, where some two ambient musicians were playing to a small audience, and uh, become interested in industrial and dark wave and kind of all kind of gothicy dark folk music. Uh, but uh, at the same time, and we are talking like 1992, 1993, somewhere around that time, I for the first time was introduced to the world of techno and house and back in the day this was more like an underground phenomenon and my first techno concert was basically some some illegally organized cellar somewhere in the on the fringes of a of a city where um i mean this was just a shabby room filled with cigarette smoke with one stroboscope light <laughs> put on the ceiling just doing this for the next five, six hours and there was this DJ playing his records and I was quite fascinated by this by this tribal monotony of the music and um, the, the intensity it had and it felt like nothing I've experienced before and there was a fascination there and uh, I kind of started to take it all in and started to show interest for, for uh, the dance music of those years and uh, there was one thing about it that I thought was fascinating and that these DJs of this kind of early, this kind of first generation DJs in Germany were really kind of really underground people interested in um, disappear, in disappearing behind the art. They were there surrounded by fog, you could hardly see them and they were playing this music and people were dancing and uh, 
names were not important. They were just, I don't know, DJ Jim or DJ Mr. Spock or whatever. Nobody really cared because that was not important. It was like the era of the spotlight driven superstar seemed to be over. And I thought from an artistic point of view, this was very fascinating. Now cut me seven years later, in Berlin in the middle of the love parade so suddenly you're standing there it's still the same sound and you're surrounded by 1.3 million people um, great experience because you kind of look around you and think yeah it's totally impossible to hijack any of these people to support some illegal war in the Orient um, this is great I like this but there's also a other aspect of it and uh, that's why I'm showing here this David Guetta <laughs> album, my only David Guetta album. Um, there is also this question that a lot of people that have been listening to techno probably ask each other, at least here in Germany, and it's the question, do you remember the moment when you realized that the people in the club are suddenly all dancing with their faces towards the DJ? And for me, this was a kind of a cultural betrayal of sorts, where I suddenly realized that this scene is also in a state of decline. Even though from a simply monetaristic point of view, from economical point of view, techno had just started to earn the big money. From, from this kind of overall economic perspective, this was just the beginning of the great years. But for me, this was kind of the end of my interest in techno because I just didn't see it. I just didn't see the reason to pay a DJ $20,000 per night. So um, he's standing there, you know, doing this and doing this every two minutes. And I'm not taking anything away from uh, the artistry of mixing vinyl records. Um, it's something I had tried myself and kind of failed. Because I quickly realized that it's just not enough to practice in your bedroom. You need to go out, you need to get a residency and you need just to learn to perform well under this heat and pressure of such an evening. You know, where every little thing you do is well heard in the hall. And uh, that's kind of something you can only do if you completely transform your life, if you become this night owl. You know, this, this, this night hawk that just li lives in the night and almost every, every night is in other clubs or in your own club and just constantly do it to get this practice to, to make no mistakes. And um, so I really knew that this is not a path for me because even as a young man I kind of wanted to be at home after midnight and so um, I'm boring, you know. <laughs> so um, I'm not taking anything away from the artistry of DJing. I just didn't feel that uh, DJs are the best material to be treated like these superstars. So, um, next question. Name a performing artist whose appeal to you is more sensual or charismatic, etc., than you'd perhaps like to readily admit. Now, I think charismatic and sensual are kind of two very different things, so let's talk about charismatic first. Um, for me, Without any doubt, um, the most charismatic performer uh, in the history of rock music must be Ian Anderson. Particularly Ian Anderson of the 70s and early 80s. It's quite a incredible package that just leaves nothing to be desired. I mean, it's qu it's quite it's quite incredible how this man managed to evoke so much energy life and his performance was so intense over a course of like two hours and uh, let's be honest on a, on a certain level he made everybody else in the rock business look kind of bad if we're talking about kind of stage entertainment combined with highly sophisticated music it's quite unheard of I think this is a kind of a unique unique situation where seeing Anderson life in his prime years amazing um, now uh, I'm pretty sure looking back uh, that I had a kind of an unresolved crush for Mark Almond of Soft Cell um, there was just something about it that kind of triggered some 
strange uh, homoerotic uh, ideas in me. I don't know. Now, where are all the women in this? Um, it's kind of an interesting question. Because I... First of all, I obviously I can distinguish between sensual and sexual. And um, I never really projected anything sexual on female artists. I just... I mean, I'm not trying to make myself look too cool for school or something. Um, but um, maybe I did when I was like 12 or 13. I mean, when I was like 13, I mean, if you if you switched on TV, you probably saw, saw some MTV videos by heart and uh, who wasn't somewhat infatuated by the Wilson sisters. But uh, that was probably a little bit their own fault because, I mean, just look at the videos. <laughs> but uh, I got this probably very quickly out of my system, I believe. And... Um, so I, I never, because it's kind of interesting, because my favorite female artist would be probably Lisa Gerard, uh, Kate Bush and Akiko Yano maybe, and I never really thought about them in any kind of sensual terms or perception. Um, maybe, um, maybe, if ever, um, the one person that probably delivers this kind of sensuality that is in question here uh, is probably Natasha Atlas. Um, I can imagine that uh, this is uh, probably the one artist that uh, I perceive as kind of overall extremely sensual, not only in her performance but uh, certainly in the type of music and the way the music is produced and the way she is singing. Um, even to the extent that it never kind of slips into this kind of a cheap uh, sexualization that you expect from some more like kind of a Hollywood top 10 uh, female superstar of these days. So, um, uh, next question. Is there a musical genre or subgenre that remains... Um, oh, no, 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 I've skipped one. <laughs> I've skipped one. Third, third or eighth question is, is there an artist who, despite all efforts on your behalf to promote to others, seems destined to be appreciate, appreciated by seemingly you and you alone? Finally, finally someone asks me that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I will, I will, um, of course, to answer this question will always be also kind of a complaint, <laughs> but it's true. Um, I think I've pushed a lot uh, in my VC videos the music of Babazula, and uh, I think I did so without uh, leaving any dent or effect <laughs> in that regard. Babazula is a band that is around for good 20 years now, um, actually a little longer, from Istanbul. Uh, the music they are playing is a mixture of dub combined with Anatolian psychedelic rock and uh, with a lot of elements of kind of a traditional uh, Anatolian music and um, it's all very kind of psychedelic and very hypnotic and it's a great band and they uh, recorded with uh, Sly and Robbie and Matt Professor and so kind of in the world of dub they're actually a kind of big name. Now surely I understand that not everyone is kind of into Turkish rock um, but uh, I think um, I can imagine that there are a lot of people in this community of music video and VC video makers that would actually pretty much like this music. Um, the other case seems to me even more severe and uh, ironically again from Istanbul, and I'm talking about uh, Gaye Suakyol, which is a singer from Istanbul. She is a composer and producer of her own music, and she is incredible. I certainly put her on the same level with uh, Kate Bush or Akiko Yano. Um, she has a amazing charisma. Um, and uh, her music is beautifully versatile, sometimes very energetic. Um, she has this great band, which kind of looks like um, kind of looks like Kato from the Green Hornet, 
Remember this uh, kind of crime TV show from the 60s with Bruce Lee? Um, so her band, they're all kind of wearing eye masks and black capes and this is more like a kind of a surf rock band. Kind of very guitar oriented and um, wonderful. And this is uh, those two records here that came out on Glitterbeat, the German label. She made three albums up until now. The first one is probably a little bit hard to get on vinyl, but you can get it on CD. Um, yeah, and I think uh, those people that would uh, overcome the inhibition of dealing with these uh, unpronounceable names um, would probably be pretty much excited about Gaia Suakyol. Uh, she's an incredible singer and wonderful performer. And her music, her music is this mixture of um, surf rock combined with kind of Ottoman, Ottoman classic Turkish music combined with elements of flamenco and Latin and um, all very kind of edgy and very thoughtful. And the albums came with um, kind of a lot of uh, like liner notes and translated lyrics and etc etc etc. What else can I do to <laughs> make it palatable for you? Uh, maybe I should undress or something. So um, that was that question. And uh, the next one is, um, is there a musical genre or subgenre that remains a mostly unexplored frontier for you? Do you think you'll ever venture more into that frontier? Certainly, um, there are things that I've never even touched. Some of them I just don't like. I never like alternative rock that much. I never like Britpop, as I said before, so I don't expect there much to happen. Interestingly, something like fusion. I've always known I will get into fusion and this was this giant monolith on the horizon uh, ahead of me and slowly moving towards me and uh, one day just happened. But I always knew that it's gonna happen. I, I was this young guy listening to prog rock and so many prog rock musicians naturally gravitated towards jazz fusion so I knew this gonna come. But the one uh, style of music that I've never really explored is hip-hop, interestingly. Now, in the late 90s I was a bit of a trip-hop fan and one could make the argument that trip-hop and hip-hop kind of on the instrumental level are uh, sometimes even indistinguishable. It certainly makes sense that someone like DJ Crush kind of makes hardly difference between trip-hop and hip-hop in his music. Um, so um, I'm kind of used to the to the kind of hip hop uh, rhythm vibe, and um, but to this kind of a true American hip hop, I never got into it. I mean, I have uh, actually I have um, one pure hip hop album here, which is uh, Escaped by Wodini, uh, which is more like this very kind of early, the first generation old school stuff, and I really like it. It's kind of interesting to listen to it and to kind of hear how they are pushing the envelope back in the day and exploring uh, kind of new sounds. Um, I certainly have Future Shock by Herbie Hancock and one could make the argument that this is basically a hip-hop album, um, but I never went all the way in. Um, and um, I guess it has to do with if you go for the real kind of hip-hop experience you really have to get into the lyrics. And uh, I never really liked those lyrics. I mean, I f understand that a lot of the lyrics can be easily misunderstood because you kind of have to contextualize them in your head. So even though this person is singing about hoes and bitches and uh, bling bling and all kind of materialistic, monetaristic thing, things that really do not hold my interest at all and oftentimes bordering kind of on, on violence and stuff like that, I understand, you have to put it in a context of the cultural history of the artist behind it. I guess uh, that's something I could master sooner or later, but um, I just was never really that interested. Also, I apologize to any hip-hop fans if my description now is a dangerous oversimplification of the matter, because I'm pretty sure that it's such a vast field that you find a lot of, lot of... Uh, uh, hip-hop artists that are obviously not singing and rapping about, I don't know, killing policemen and keeping women as slaves. But um, I guess I never, I never, ha I never had this kind of a uh, hip-hop versed friend that was, would kind of introduce me to the more subtle and more intricate uh, 
aspects of hip hop. So this never happened. And finally, the last question. Mm. Excuse me. Overall, do you think that the instant access opportunities of the internet have enhanced or diminished or neither the experience of exploring, discovering and fully enjoying music? That's a wonderful, very timely uh, question. Um, yeah, um, I guess uh, to quote the German uh, poet and philosopher Johann Wolfgang Goethe, there are kind of two souls uh, living uh, in my chest. The one soul constantly tries to escape and the other one more clings to the flesh. And um, on the one hand, I because in all other traits of life, putting music aside, I've always supported the notion that if we want to survive as a civilization, we will heavily need to change our thinking about possession and we will heavily have to walk towards a society that has access and walk away from a society that tries to possess and to own. That the idea of ownership and possession as something that is uh, required or that is desirable needs to kind of vanish out of our society so we can kind of create a more or less uh, harmonious uh, relationship to this planet because otherwise um, the path we are on is rather leading uh, leading down the drain so um, how does this train of thought relate to me being a collector of vinyl records? Well, it basically does not. It's a contradiction. Probably the truth is that uh, a civilization can make only these steps forward when our generation, yours and mine, Jeff, has already died out. I mean, that's just the reality of things, because there are just things that we will not be able to detach ourselves because they are so close to our own personal culture. But um, I fully uh, support when young kids just want to have everything in their mobile phone. Um, and um, that's it. And they have this access. And um, I just hope they will translate this kind of thinking on different levels of their kind of social existence. Because obviously the biggest uh, transgressors uh, when it comes to environment uh, are not are not companies producing CDs and uh, records. The biggest transgressors are basically people producing produce, producing food for this entire planet. And the way we do it and the, the wasteful way we do it uh, is a giant problem that is uh, 100,000 times larger than the question if I have 2,000 records in a room somewhere or not. Simply from this kind of a socio-economical and environmentalist perspective. Um, that being said, um, yeah, I, I love to watch, for example, some of uh, these kind of reaction videos by young kids when they kind of encounter a new song and they kind of film themselves while listening to it. And um, I think that's all great. Um, but the kind of uh, old dude inside of me sometimes slightly skeptical thinking yeah but is it really deserved i mean is it really deserved to be just this person with a mobile phone and say let's listen to this song and then you just click on it on spotify you kind of you you, you have not you have not kind of um, delivered the sacrifice of spending your entire <laughs> wealth and fortune on records and basically ruining yourself and then you have acquired the right to talk about it not in this kind of a cheap 9.99 per month way with a spotify account <laughs> which uh, philosophically is not a sound notion i'm fully aware of that and on an intellectual de level i reject my own thinking here because it's obviously nonsense. It kind of relates to the same debate that happens within the vinyl community all the time when sometimes people kind of attack someone for having a kind of cheap turntable and yeah, you are not a real uh, aficionado if you use this crappy turntable. This is a dangerous train of thought which is very materialistic and because oftentimes we are talking about young people 
and uh, we kind of project uh, this uh, incredible waste of money on them and trying to force them into it which is a little creepy I think particularly because those are maybe people that have just started to kind of set up their lives or started a family on, and uh, so uh, maybe there are different things on their minds than uh, spending $300 every month for music. So um, that's kind of what crosses my mind in answering uh, the this last question. And uh, that's it. It was still a little long-winded. Uh, yeah, so um, as I said at the beginning, uh, have a look at Jeff's uh, wonderful um, music channel. And uh, you, I'm pretty sure you will discover a ton of things that you have not known before. And um, also he's extremely entertaining and uh, for me uh, as someone who watches a lot of stuff on YouTube that's very important. So um, have a nice day and uh, stay tuned. Goodbye.